different with ever that hurt to our tired eyes it might seem too late our world's been infected with handed out hate Martin had a dream to teach us all to pray Martin had a dream to take the hate away Martin had a dream of dignity for all Martin had a dream Step in rhetoric, firing up the fray To lonely exiles who've been turned away All waiting on the word, all waiting on grace Offered up freely, regardless of race Martin had a dream to teach us all to pray Martin had a dream to take the heat away Violence and hatred run free in our yard. Martin had a dream that we all can share if we humble our hearts and bow them in prayer. Martin had a dream to teach us all to pray. Martin had a dream to take the hate away. Martin had a dream of dignity for all. Welcome to Antelope Park Church's online worship. We are glad you're tuning in and hope you will join us in the future in person. Please join me in reading the call to worship. Come Lord Jesus, fill our hearts. Allow your spirit to bind us together in love, despite race, color, status, and political ideologies. We pray to love our neighbors and lend a helping hand. We pray to love our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. We especially ask for help to love those who hate or harm us. Help us to forgive and love them through their iniquities. We also need help to look within first, to see our part in issues and to repent and turn to you instead of the world. Amen.
prayer. Waymaker and Redeemer, we praise and worship you today. Guide us to let love lead. Help lead us to repentance, for on our knees is where true surrender to your will and your ways is what is needed in this world. Help us begin with ourselves. Look within to see ways in which we have not let our love lead in our relationships inside and outside the church. We beg for mercy for the state of this nation at this time, Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for peace, for healing, for reconciliation. We cry out and lament to you, Spirit, to intercede and grant us ears to hear from your word today. Be with those suffering and in need of healing today, Jesus, especially Ziggy, Brian, John, Janet, and many others on our hearts today. Be with the lonely and the grieving. We praise you and worship you. Show us opportunities and the courage to lead with love in this divisive world. Give us clarity and ways forward that will lead us to reconciliation and justice. We pray as your disciples, the prayer you taught us, Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. comes from Luke 6, 
verses 27 to 42, and is separated into two parts, love for enemies and judging others. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will be not condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. He also told them a parable. Can a blind person guide a bl blind person? Will not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully qualified will be like the teacher. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, friend, let me take out the speck in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. So far in this sermon series on racial justice, we looked at two things broadly, that we should put our trust in God and not man using Psalm 72, pointing to Christ as the only King worthy of our following, and that we should speak truth given to us by the Holy Spirit and be courageous for God is with us, using John 16 and Joshua 1, 9, where we called out the sin of racism. Today, we will examine another important precursory notion that I feel is necessary to look at before we delve into God's justice, his demands relating to justice, and some of the ugly history we have inherited in regards to racism all the way back to the beginning. This topic of partisanship is so relevant today. In the midst of such division and crazy events we have witnessed, and I must say, this is God's doing the timing, not mine. Since September or so, I have wanted to start this sermon series, but put it off as we were in the midst of our visioning series, and then the season of Advent was upon us. In the meantime, I've been researching and sensing where God would lead and planned this for January. But then with such a volatile time dealing with the election, me having an upcoming surgery in February, and COVID reeling out of control, stopping us from meeting in person still. I was thinking maybe we should wait and do this after Easter, but God put it on my heart that now was the time and that the spirit would guide. And lo and behold, God's timing proved to be correct. As I think seeking ways to best follow God's ways of justice is so important right now. And yet this is such a touchy subject, such a hot button issue as Jillian conveyed so well last week. 
It saddens me that somehow racism has become so politicized. If you've not seen it, there's a statement put out by the Church of the Brethren leadership that named this. And it, it said that the riot at the Capitol laid bare racism and hatred and breached the country's democratic process. Then it said this, may we together confess our brokenness that the deep divisions within our country are also present in our church and commit to pray for the healing of our country and our church as we all together pray and work for the peace of Christ, the shalom of God. On this post, there were some comments of how the church shouldn't pick sides. I just don't understand why we're not questioning how naming racism as sin is seen as political. I've never seen it so pronounced as this coming last year. And maybe it's just because I'm less naive, like I discussed a little last week, or maybe it has to do with the political or media rhetoric we're constantly hearing that brought us here. But bringing up racial justice now means someone's labeled a leftist, a Democrat, a Marxist. Like when did believing all humans should be treated equally become part of partisan politics? And even more importantly to me as a pastor, why is this partisan politics being brought into our churches and more and more? Now one may say, well, isn't that what you're doing? Well, that's not my intent. And that surely is not what this message is about and not what this series is about either. The point of this message is that our political climate has seeped even into our churches and inside and out, we are demonizing each other that disagree with certain views we have. Are we really going to let whatever forces are upon us, whether they're foreign or domestic or spiritual, make us take sides on issues of justice for all in America? Tearing apart relationships of siblings of Christ in the church? Is looking at our own complicity and the history of racism too hard instead of looking to God's will for justice and his hopes for us to participate in fighting injustice? According to Drew Hart in Who Will Be a Witness, pastors tend to preach to the choir in line with the obvious partisan platforms which each church is already associated with. Beyond that, God is shoved into corners or privatized spirituality and allowed out only when needed to battle in a partisan or culture war. It's hard to distinguish Christianity's commitments from the political parties of her day, he says. Christian ethics appeared to be aligned to certain platforms of Republicans or Democrats or a wishy-washy moderate. And these moderate churches try to play to the middle ground, avoiding risky conversations that are critical and how systems and policy affects their neighbors. They're no more courageous than partisan churches and they believe being centrist is the answer to polarization. They like to say truth lies somewhere in the middle of serious social concerns between what conservatives or progressives may say regarding it. According to Christian Smith, a professor at Notre Dame, the church in America has been in decline for decades, partly due to partisan politics. But putting our emphasis on God's word above our party's affiliation should be seen as paramount. He says the more political allegiance is stressed in the church, the more it conflicts with its genuine purpose. Now this could be on both sides of the aisle, I will add. We can see it in the rise of the religious right stemming from the moral majority, focus on the family or the Christian coalition, and we can see it on the left emphasizing only social justice issues with no sense of urgency for evangelism or personal surrender to Jesus or even 
individual choices and freedoms on both sides. Some churches have formed churches around politics rather than the gospel, he says. And his heart says, the truth is both parties have endorsed oppressive and unjust policies that have been devastating to vulnerable people. And neither has gotten close to aligning with the shalom discussed in our sacred texts or seen in the way Jesus lived. Churches and pastors that align with one side of politics attract members with partisan values and cause the church body to suffer division. And being too homogeneous is detrimental to the building up of the body of Christ. I take that very seriously and is the reason I want to remain impartial and focus on what scripture says. I know that I'm fallible and need to be kept on a short lease, so to speak. As we know, God says, love your neighbor. And we say in this church, that means every neighbor. And so that needs to include those with different views. In fact, this may be who God is calling us to love right now, especially. According to Thomas McDaniels, a pastor of a Texas church who writes for Fox News about the dangers of partisan politics from the pulpit, speaking on a political subject is a balancing act. He says it's unnecessary for pastors to foster partisanship on the issues as the Bible's clear on most, either agreeing or disagreeing with them. That a pastor's job is to teach what God says about the issues that cross over into political environments, not to influence political beliefs. So we have to be careful not to come across as the woke ones and that others are somehow inferior. So while speaking truth, we need to be sure we are loving, not falling into the trap of blaming, placing people into boxes or feeling superior. Now I will add, I sometimes have felt convicted of this, especially on social media. As we know, everything is seen to be political that you say. And when examining scripture, it can be twisted or taken out of context to fit a particular message. During the last month, I've been watching some self-proclaimed prophets, one in Omaha, espousing God's providence in a political party that really truly disturbs me. This to me goes against Jesus being the only king to be worshiped. Then the day after the riots, I listened to a radio show interviewing four of them. There was no sense of repentance or praising of Jesus, but instead I heard rhetoric that you would expect to hear from a politician, twisting scripture in the form of Christian nationalism. And today I read some articles about these pastors and that they're receiving death threats from their own followers due to these prophecies not taking place. This is very disturbing on so many levels. That night I watched it, I was praying, and God convicted me to see how I too was demonizing instead of looking with love and compassion. While I would still rebuke the words I heard, I know that God was allowing me to see my part in the problem of this divided country. And I have no doubt there is outside forces willing, willfully meaning to divide us. And boy, is it working. So much so that we're even letting a stand against injustice of racism divide us in the body of Christ, in our neighborhoods, our families even. It's crazy, but this is where we're at. The other day, Smitty and I were watching a Netflix comedy titled Death to 2020. A lady in it said, you just need to pick a side and hunker down, referring to our politicized culture. That's truly what it feels like. Like we might be at the brink of a civil war even, I dare say. Everyone seems to be looking at every person and saying, are you with us or against us? And little of it has to do with following Christ. Later that evening, I watched a video of Francis John having a conversation with two Orthodox preachers. 
And I'm saying that Jesus wants us to be one. In your bulletin, I put a scripture that relates to this. John 13, 34 and 35. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. That just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. In this video, the pastor said what I believe. We cannot be a witness to the world when we're demonizing each other. And I will add how we can, how can we bear fruit and focus on the work of God when we're busy demonizing fellow siblings of Christ even. Now, another topic that has always intrigued me that relates to this is the divisions of the church throughout history. There was differences in worship with the Samaritans and the Jews, both thinking they were worshiping correctly. Then there were Pharisees and the Sadducees, Israel and Judah. There was the division of the Jew and the Gentile in Jesus' day. Then the Christian church forming itself, while the Jews split into Messianic Jews and Orthodox. Then the Catholic church split. The Protestants were born, and so on, and so on. Now, I know there's other factions I didn't go into, but you get the gist. Now, even in the Protestant denominations, we have a subsplit of evangelical and mainline Protestants. And there's tens of thousands under each of these subheadings. We have people in the COB that would argue on either side, whether we're evangelical or mainline. I won't get into why and how this is. But when will this end? It seems to me we're allowing the enemy to divide and conquer. Now to let you know, most of the next part I will share comes from a sermon I found regarding the issue of partisanship in the church from last February by Reverend Brad Barton from the First Christian Church in Grand Junction, Colorado. Going back to John 13 and others knowing we are disciples by the way we love one another, that's a big deal and places a lot of responsibility on us. If you live out of a desire to do what's best for others, seeking out those in need and offering assistance, this proclaims something about who Jesus is. And if you live selfishly instead, you are saying something else to the world about the identity of Christ. So in relating this to today's times we are in, we need to show we are loving others. The Greek word Jesus uses when he said love one another in this new commandment translates to show preference for. It's about following God's lead to show we are putting others before ourselves. One more scripture to look at is 1 Corinthians 3, 3 and 4, in which Paul scolds the church members, saying, for as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? He's saying to not argue about petty things or divide themselves up into groups, that they should be in fellowship with each other, all being followers of Christ, even in the midst of disagreement. Sounds a lot like what is going on today, doesn't it? Do you believe in this party or this one? In the conservative or progressive factions of the church, and I think we should take heed to this warning, that this is indicative of the following, of following the way of people instead of God. So we can look at divisive issues as a sort of test of our faith lived out in community. I wanna note, if you're hearing something beneficial in these sermons of, throughout this series, it should not depend on whether you lean left or right politically. It has nothing to do with which side is better. It would not be loving if I preached showing a preference to one side or the other. So please don't take it that way. 
Now, what do I mean by partisanship? In the Miriam D Dictionary, it's described as a firm adherent to a faction, cause, or purpose, especially one exhibiting blind, prejudiced, and unreasoning allegiance. So you see, when we bring this into the church, we are claiming one side right and the other wrong. This causes harm and therefore cannot be loving. Now, some people might not like that dictionary definition, might become defensive, thinking, look, look at the wrongs committed by the other party or the good my party has done. Put plainly, partisan politics involves being predisposed towards certain views and intolerant of others. And since we only have two parties, this makes us with this either or mentality. There's a dualistic mentality that I discussed in today's news. Even if you don't agree with this definition, just know that's what I mean when I'm talking about it here. And please hear me, this is not lifting up one side or dragging down another. So how can we let love lead during such a time of partisanship inside and outside the church? What might love say to it? I planned this, the outline of this series back in December. So the happenings of this week had nothing to do with this, the theme of this message although I did narrow it and choose a different focus, love. And please know that I'm not pointing out that one side to the events is right or not in the last few weeks either. This message could consider how love leads in foreign countries without Democrats or Republicans. It could also relate to the past or the future too. So Purbar in love encourages diversity of opinion. Sometimes it may feel like the world would be a better place if we all just got along and agreed, right? On everything. That isn't what Paul was suggesting in Corinthians, saying not to quarrel, as forcing others to agree or discounting those who disagree is not a very loving or godly way to act. Paul even writes later in this letter about love not insisting on its own way. Remember, love is about caring for others before yourself. So if you disrespect or ignore people who disagree with you, you are counting them as unworthy. God gave man free will back in Genesis 2. And even though we can agree it's harmful that some do not choose God. The point is that out of love, God gave us that free will, knowing our opinions would be wrong. When people made bad choices over bad choices over and over, he didn't write them off. He endured their waywardness until he finally gave the ultimate redemption by sending his one and only son to be a ransom. And what does partisanship do? It rejects people with differing opinions, even refusing to talk to them or makes them feel or look unworthy. Love is incompatible with partisan politics. We should be able to love people with different views about how our nation should be governed or anything else politically, even if we think they're wrong. And we should provide an example about love overcoming partisanship as Christians. Love demands that we show the world a better way and then this divisiveness that Paul called of the flesh. And notice we didn't say you have to agree, only love them. This act of love should establish real relationships that allow for dialogue getting to know the person, their fears, their joys, their worldview, their understanding of how things work. This means letting go of the idea that we just don't talk about politics. Per Barton, this could be a reason for the decline of the church. We need to trust God enough to live out the love we proclaim, even with political opponents. 
If we cower away from conversation and relationship, then we cannot love those with differing opinions. And we're communicating that we don't trust in God's power to overcome our disagreements, that we serve a weak God, not one able to work past our infallibilities, who can move mountains despite our mistakes and even our biases. And only if we can stay connected to the vine and seek him at all times. If we pretend to be loving on the outside, but sneer or ridicule people when we're with like-minded friends, then we're not really preferring the other. And loving, and people will sense it. Your love must be real. So I guess we need to find someone on the other side of the aisle and engage in real discussions and build relationships. Keeping God and love at the forefront allowing ourselves to be changed as a result. If this makes you uncomfortable, just know <clears throat> that's due to culture, not a reflection of love or God. I usually cringe at scriptures that deal with enemies, as in my eyes I've always thought we shouldn't have any enemies. But look at this way, with regard to politics, haven't we been doing what Jesus warned us against for too long? Haven't we been loving only those who agree with us and not our metaphorical enemies, meaning those on the other side of the aisle? Isn't it time for us to follow the example of God's love so we can show the world a better way? So let us consider what Jesus says about loving enemies. We heard Ziggy read this out of the sixth chapter of Luke. And we see right away in the scripture that God's agenda is a plan of love. Love your enemies. He goes on to say good to do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. This isn't about our feelings. This is a love that puts others first, does something for them gives preference. When we bless those who curse us, it means we speak well of people even when they speak ill of us. A tough order and one we are not so inclined to do. So it has to be with great intention <clears throat> that we remember this. He then says we need to be willing to suffer wrong. When someone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other. When someone takes something, give them more and don't ask for it back. Striking someone in the cheek is like insulting them. And our nature says, strike back, insult them even more. But when we patiently bear offenses, we are trusting that God will defend us and his cause. Because it aligns with God's will. We should sacrificially give and love. Upside down thinking for sure. And again, a tall order, right? I've had people steal from me when I trusted them. Or a stranger take something and just be gone. And I've once or twice been able to say, I guess they needed it more than me. But I also learned something to protect myself from being abused again in the future by that person or a situation. And so I should be grateful for that. This is, by the way, repeated in Paul in Romans 12, 21 and used by Martin Luther King Jr. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Then there's the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, this was a teaching by many people at the time. Jesus turned it from a negative command to a positive one. He was making it broader. Like, don't just not break a traffic law, but go help the stranded person over there. This could also apply to Christian fellowship, per David Guzik. If we want to have people reach out to us and experience love, then we have to reach out to them. And then we have an explanation of God's pattern in love. 
in verses 32 to 35. If you love those who love you or do good to you, what credit is that for you? But love your enemies, it says. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great. You will be sons of the Most High. See, for he is kind and to the unthankful and evil. Jesus is teaching us the character of the citizens of his kingdom, which should be different than we see in the world. Perguzik, there's a reason for this. We claim to have something others don't, that we can be repentant, renewed, and redeemed by Jesus, that we have the power of being able to do all things through him. And the phrase sons of the most high means by doing this, we are imitating God's love towards us as sinners. Spurgeon says God is saying, this is the day of free grace. This is the time of mercy. Then we are given principles to follow. Be merciful as your father is and condemn not or you shall be judged and condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and to the same measure you will be given. Now, many people will condemn Christians for this verse, and I do believe we can say we are nowhere near perfect at this, but it's also a bit misunderstood. Jesus says to know ourselves and others right after this passage in verses 43 and 45 to 45 by their fruit of their life. So we must show compassion and love for we already for those that we already know their fruit, that they have good intentions, especially if they're in the fellowship of God. And for this message, I say we should not judge people by their political views as being non-Christian or that they're wrong even. As this is saying, we may not have the whole story. We should get to know why they think this way and act from a place of love and compassion instead of judgment. I like what Guzik said about rushing to harsh judgments, that we break this command when we think the worst of others, when we speak only of someone's faults, when we judge an entire life by the worst moments, when we judge hidden motives, or without considering ourselves in the same circumstances, or that we will be judged. And he doesn't just say don't judge, but condemn not to freely forgive. Point more tall orders and ones we must always be on the lookout for in our interactions. And he says to give forgiveness and mercy for it will also be given to you. It will be running over. So don't, we don't have to be fearful of giving. Simply stated, we can't outgive God. He will return more to us as we are patterning our giving after the Father's love per Barclay. Then in verses 39 to 42, he gives an illustration through a parable. Can the blind lead the blind? They will both fall in a ditch. We should not look to humans to be our leader. Jesus, who sees and knows all things, is the one we need to look after, for we are all partially blind. Jesus says this to religious leaders in Matthew 15. He's saying no human teacher has all the answers to what scripture says. And Jesus is saying the responsibility falls not just to the blind leaders, but also to the blind followers. The life and teachings of Jesus is what we should follow, the only perfect leader. And so never just take what I tell you or other teachers. Ask questions. Discuss it in groups. What are you hearing and reading from the scriptures for yourselves? Don't be a blind person being led by another imperfect blind person. Search for truth and ask God for guidance. Try your best to be like Jesus, not like anyone here on earth, for we all fall short of the glory of God. And then the well-known verse, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, 
but do not see the plank in your own. Hypocrite, he says, first remove the plank from your eye. Then you will see clearly to remove the speck in your brother's eye. Jesus shows that we're far more tolerant to our own sin than the sin of others. He's using these exaggerated pictures for us to remember and for it to be easily understood. He's also saying we can't really help someone with a fault if we have a similar or worse one that we're not examining. This is like me being convicted of calling out what I see as incorrect teaching. Here I was doing what I said I don't want to be done, right? And our hypocrisy is always seen by others more than ourselves. Others see the plank in our eye immediately. He's not saying don't help the brother with their sin. He's saying first deal with your own. Now, with this being the day before MLK Junior Day, and even on a day when there's warnings of more political protests, some with hate symbols and threats of violence, I want to bring up some thoughts from sermons of Martin Luther King Jr.'s that he spoke regarding loving enemies. The first is from a sermon in 1957, where he used his story from a scene I saw in Hamilton this summer. And you might remember if you saw it. He said that when Abraham Lincoln was running for president, his adversary, Edward Stanton, ridiculed him a great deal. And when he was elected, Lincoln appointed him as Secretary of War. He did so for two reasons. He was the best person for the job, and he wanted to transform Stanton's hatred toward him, which it did. Love is a powerful tool, more so than hate. Per King, if Abraham Lincoln had hated Stanton, they both would have gone to their graves hating each other. Hate destroys the hater as well as the hated, because with it, there is no redemption or transformation. But if you love your enemies, you will discover that at the very root of love is the power of redemption. He also discussed practical solutions, <clears throat> saying that love is a practice that requires facing the fact that someone might dislike us because of something we did in the past. There's the plank in our own eye. That we have to discern the difference between like and love as love is understanding that we help those we feel are enemies, saying that we rise to love, we seek to defeat evil systems that people are caught up in, and that we try to see the good in all. He said, within the best of us, there's some evil, and within the worst of us, there is some good that we should discover the element of good in our enemies. As you seek to hate, find the center of goodness and place your attention there and you will take a new attitude, he said. And he said in another sermon that Jesus says, love your enemies because love builds up and is created, but hate tears down and is destructive. We can love an enemy, he said, by getting rid of enmity and transform them into a friend. So despite this extreme partisanship we see in culture surrounds us in so many ways, especially in the news, let us let love lead. Seeking to understand, have compassion, we can love. And we shouldn't judge, lest we will also be judged. And most importantly, we'll miss out on what God has in store for us and the world. Amen.
God allow you the grace to let love lead by focusing on Jesus, no matter what we see in the world. May God grant us grace to let love lead.